right guys welcome back to the channel this is going to be another one of my technical channel uh, uh, vlogs I'm going to be fitting a lithium battery in my van in the near future um, so I'm going to go over what I'm doing to fit that battery one of the batteries that I'm getting is from a company called Roma which is a UK based company they uh, make their batteries here in Yorkshire but um, well design it in, in, in this country um, they're made in China and brought over like most probably lithium batteries um, and they distribute them from Yorkshire they're a, a small company that used to do van conversions and they hire them at um, across the Alps if you're interested in that I'll put a little tiny link at the bottom of the video for them but the reason why I picked them specifically is because they make a under seat battery designed they, and they designed it for the Volkswagen van under seat which is, should be exactly the same as any other van conversion or vans um, and we've got the Adria van and so the lithium battery should sit nicely underneath the passenger seat which is where the Adria fitted their batteries so it's a 200 amp hour battery um, with um, Bluetooth connection for the BMS system so I'll give a little review when that turns up at the moment we're having a lot of problems in the UK of getting things delivered because of um, what happened with Covid and because of that tanker that got stuck and I expect that's probably the same across most of Europe anyway um, so that the battery should hopefully be in in July but that gives me some time to do some work on the van so one of the things with modern vans if people don't know is that sometimes you have smart alternators um, most Euro 6 engines nowadays on new vans would have the smart alternator well, they call it smart alternator it's actually an, an alternator that's controlled by the electronic computer of the van the ECU um, which turns the, the alternator voltage down to 12 volts when you're at low revs or the starter battery doesn't need charging which means that you're not getting any charge to your leisure battery but even if you haven't got a smart alternator and you're fitting lithium batteries because lithium batteries have almost no resistance inside them compared to lead acid and if you have a, a really low um, charged lithium battery it will take as much current as it can take from your alternator and if you've got a 100 amp hour lithium battery say it's sitting there 80 amp hours down um, it's probably going to try and pull in that 80 amp hours out of your cabling your alternator and everything else within your electrical system on the van now although people I've seen people say that this works and it you can just drop them in it works um, you've got to be really careful because you overheat your alternator because they only cool themselves down through the fins and then you over time spend up burning out your alternator um, over a period of time um, or you could do it quite quick and you'll just see smoke coming out of your alternator so you've got to be really careful with that and so one of the reasons you can protect yourself is to fit what's called a B2B they're called B2B, they're DC to DC converters and I've got one here which is the Orion TR Smart um, B2B um, I bought the isolated one by mistake um, and I'll go over that in a minute reason why but this basically converts the DC voltage coming from the van, the battery yeah. Um, and it convert uh, and it converts it to a DC output. I've used them on the TV. We might have seen my previous vlogs where I've done a, a DC to DC, 12 volts to 19 volts to run the TV. And um, this one does 12 volts to 12 volts. You can get 12 volts to 24 volts because it can convert it up. But one of the things that this mainly does, it will keep a constant voltage using, I believe, a buck converter inside, which means that if it's only got 12 volts going in, it'll still give the charging voltage 13 or uh, 14 volts coming out. But it'll also limit the current. This one's a 12, 12, 30, so it means 30 means it's limiting at 30 amps. So this would only give out 30 amps. So even though the battery would be trying to ask for more, this will make sure that it'll only get 30 amps. So that's one of the reasons why we put these in, to protect your alternator, set your cabling um, on the van and everything else. Um, but it also gives a nice charge um, voltage and on the lithium settings it also turn off the charge when the lithium battery is fully charged because you don't want to overcharge lithium batteries either so that's one of the other good things about these um, going back to the isolating bit if you know that your van is completely separate on the negative side on your ledger battery um, side of the van compared to your vehicle va battery so the negatives are not connected together basically then you should go for isolating and the reason why the isolating is there it's um, just to protect electronics within the van from noise from the engine so if you know your negatives are connected together which I found out the Adria is um, my mistake for not looking it up first place you should go for the non-isolating because it's about 40 pounds cheaper than this one 
But at the end of the day, if you do buy these, and which I found out for Victron as well, just to make sure you can connect the negatives up, it will still work. It just means I paid more for it than I needed to. One of the other things to think about in these as well is you can see the big metal thing at the back, the black thing is called a heat sink. This dissipates the heat that this device um, um, makes because they've got um, probably MOSFETs on the back, built on the back of this, which are producing a lot of hot heat. Now I've been t told and seen other people saying that these get really hot. So you, when you're mounting this, you don't really want to be mounting this on plastic or anything like that, or anything that's going to sort of warp or melt a little bit. Or it won't, it, I shouldn't think it'd get hot enough to melt plastic uh, stuff. But it could cause it to warp a bit and stuff like that. So I'm going to try and put some spacers on these because it's going to go up against the plastic uh, part where you see it in the van, um, and that should be fine. On the connections, there's four connections on the front there. Um, it all basically is is two coming from your battery from your van, uh, positive and negative, and two coming from your leisure battery, positive and negative. So it's quite an easy thing to connect up. This plug here. It's got a link in it at the moment, and with this link in it, it means this device would work. If you take that link out, it won't work. You can disconnect this and put a switch in there, so make so that it's, you can switch the device on and off. So when you're on site, you can make sure it's permanently on. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, you can also connect, I think, believe it's the right-hand side of this connection to your B, D+, plus, which is your ignition um, on the van, so that it switches on only when the van ignition is on. Um, and I believe you can connect the, the other side to negative to do the sort of same thing, but I don't know why really um, on that. Someone else might explain that one. But the reason I'm mentioning that is that some people, these, talk about these compared to other ones. Um, this one is called a smart um, D to, D to B to B converter. And the reason why it's called smart is because it detects the voltage of the van, uh, the, leisure, the, the vehicle battery, which is 12, about just over 12 volts when you're not running the vehicle. And as soon as that battery jumps up, because you've started the engine to about 13 and a half, depending on what it is on your van, it will know that the engine's running, and so it'll switch on to start charging your battery. Now, a lot of the other ones in the market, they connect to your engine ignition, the same as what you can do on these, so this does do it, um, and they work by switching on only when the engine ignition is switched on. Um, the bonus of these is that you haven't got to run that ignition switch, it can do it automatically for a smart system, so it's less wiring. The negative on these, which I've heard, but I haven't proved it yet, is that if you're charging your starter battery off your solar panels, um, and the solar panels are putting in 14 volts into the starter battery, this will see that 14 volts, and it could switch on, even though your engine's not running. So you're gonna start um, connecting up your lithium battery, or your uh, leisure battery, to your starter battery when you're on a campsite, because this is switched on, and you could end up draining the battery on the starter battery. Now I'm not sure how true that is on draining the battery because if your starter battery is seeing the 14 volts and your leisure battery is getting the 14 volts, depending I suppose on the capacity of the charge on the batteries, it pop, there is a possibility that could happen. Um, so that's why this could be quite handy to connect this up. So you put a switch on here. If you're on campsite and you're on there for a week or a couple of week, a weekend, you might as well switch this off so you know that this will not switch on and then switch it on when you're going back out on the road. But you've got to remember to switch it on and off. So there is a negative with that depending on how true that is. So you comment below, tell us if you've come across that, if you've had that issue. Um, other than that, the only thing I can mention about these, I mean, this is Victron. Um, these are quite expensive, but I like Victron because they're quite rugged, they're well built. Ah, Bluetooth as well. And these come with Bluetooth connection. And with a Bluetooth connection, you can change a lot of the power meters on this. You can set the voltage that you switch on that, you can set the lithium voltage. Um, I think you can probably see the current readings. We'll have a look at the app when it's up and running, but you can do a lot more with it, and that's why I love, I like Victron. Um, other companies out there, Sterling. Sterling, I think, believe, do a Bluetooth version, and they are a pretty good company. I was gonna go with Sterling batteries, actually, at one point, um, but it's only because I couldn't get them under the seat that I went with Roma. Um, the other ones are Renergy, and I like Renergy. I've got Renergy Solar controllers down at my allotment. I've got Renergy um, uh, solar panels. I'm going to be buying because I do like Renergy for solar panels. And I was almost going to buy a Renergy D to D converter. The only reason why I didn't is because of the Bluetooth. Um, Renergy do the ignition startup, which I was talking about, um, which is pretty good. And they are a lot cheaper than a Victron. So if, you, if you're on a budget, go for Renergy. They're pretty good, really. Um, the only thing you don't get is the Bluetooth, and you'll have to set up all the settings using, I think, dip switches, which is a bit of a fiddly thing if you get it wrong. That's the only downside, and you can't see what's going on. 
So I think that's about as much as I can say about these and the reason why we fit them. And then I'll show you where I'm gonna be fitting it and how I'm gonna fit it. Now, a couple of other things you're gonna need. You need to have some sort of protection from your leisure battery into the um, this system and from your starter battery into this system. It can be a fuse, which is quite easy to install because if anything shorts out, you've got really heavy cables going between the two batteries that can pull hundreds of amps. So, so I'm not using fuse, I'm gonna be using these breakers, which a lot of people have reviewed already. Um, these work exactly the same as a circuit breaker in your house. You've got a test button that you can push there, that this flips out, which switches it off. So it's like an isolator then, and you just push it in to reset it. And if it goes above the current rating of this, it will trip out and protect your van. So yeah, I'm going for the, one of these each side of the battery. Like I say, you can buy a fuse, they do mega fuses, which work just as good, just means you have to change the fuse if it ever blows, but realistically the fuse shouldn't blow. The bonus of these is that you can isolate the circuit if you need to without getting them span them out and undoing everything. So the ones I'm using are rated at 40 amps. My Victron controller is rated at 30 amps. So I only want to go a little bit above that. I don't want to go to the cable rating size, which I've seen a lot of people say, well, my cable can take 100 amps, so I'm going to put 100 amp one of these in. The downside of that is that if you have a, a short circuit, or not no, so much of a short circuit, because it'll probably blow it, but an overloaded um, circuit, where the overload's running at, say, 80 amps, on a 100 amp circuit breaker, it won't trip. But 80 amps would put a huge amount of heat again down them cables and do a lot of damage to your van again. So you don't want to be rating your fuse at the rate that a cable can take because you're gonna, if anything goes wrong, you're gonna burn your van out. So lastly, the cables, I'll go over. Um, I'm running 16 millimeter cables. One of the things you need to know about the cables is that they need to be the flexible cables that you get for vehicles, not the stuff you get for household. Um, you can get 16 millimeter, uh, which sometimes people call meter towels. Um, which we used to use as an electrician and the problem with them is they're quite solid strands and they will break and deteriorate over time with the vehicle movement and the vibrations especially at the crimp end and those cracks within the copper will cause um, heat damage and voltage drops and stuff like that so you lose voltage charge and stuff like that and it, it'll break down over time. These are multi-strand and I'll show you that when I strip it down um, so they're more flexible which is great for um, vehicle use. I'm using 16 millimeter cable on mine um, my calculations, which I'll go over later, the reasons why I use 16mm. The IEE regs put these down at about 84 amps, I believe. Some people say they can take 125, but they can't really take that for a continuous period of time because of the heat that these will generate. Um, right. You've got to take into account the amount of current these, these can take. The voltage drop needs to be less than 3% of, of the uh, voltage that you're going to be putting into it, which um, adds to be about 14 volts, so 3% of that. So you need to work that one out when you're going for cable sizing. And then you need to take into account temperature, which um, no, no. so I'll go, I'll go over that in a minute with the graphs because at 80 odd amps, if you're pulling that through these, um, I can't remember off my head, but I think it was one at 60 degree temperatures on the core of these, which is gonna be bloody hot, you can't touch it. And that's gonna be running alongside your lithium battery and your leisure battery. So you don't really want them sort of temperatures running on there. So you, you pick the cables down to them three things that we need to take into account. You probably could calculate it and get away with 10 mil, which is probably well within the um, safety um, part of running these. But 16 mil cables to 10 mil cables cost wise isn't that much. And now the biggest thing as well that you want to do is get the man maximum amount of current yeah, through these cables to your lithium batteries and everything without dropping any voltage or any, any losses. So the lower the gap down you go on the, on the cables, the more losses you're going to get. So 16 mil is pretty good. I've seen people use 35 mil, but I don't know how you get 35 mil in them little terminals on that uh, Victron controller. So 16 mil should be fine. You will see that on your van um, from the manufacturers, they use a quite a small cable, probably about, looking at it, it might be about four mil, I haven't measured it, but they use, they dual it up, they parallel it. Um, so if you're running two four mils parallel, it's actually eight mils, or two six mil parallel, is 12 mil so it parallels up same as household wiring when you par parallel things up um so i think that's about it i think i've rabbited on enough about the technical side and reasons why i picked certain things i expect people would might disagree with some of the stuff i'm going to go through now the installation um install it into the van and explain some parts of the um electrical electronics of the van and what you need to disconnect to do what i'm going to be doing so we get on with that now
right just show you the cable one that i've done so far for getting to the battery and if you didn't know the vehicle battery on adria vans underneath here there's a panel that comes off underneath here these are the cables that i've just run um it goes into the victim controller which i'll show you later on this will be clamped down so that it's underneath the seat area i might put a bit of protection over there if it is catching at all but it should be all right there's a bit of protection tubing down here because it's going down under the floor area here into the ducting there's a ducting uh, under here to get all this out which you have to do is get this through neatly um, there's a few screws here that are just little clamps that you just pull off to get to them screws there's two screws on the bottom one down here you have to undo the, this side one as well to get this off and then there's this one here two screws and one round the side to take that off and then all this comes off very very easily um, and so you can get the cable through neatly so that's the cable run from the battery start battery to the, the DC to DC right so that's the battery compartment done um, this is my new supply coming in over here I'll put a bit of protection over this area um, for the negative which is going onto, onto here you've got spare um, pins on these negatives the positives going down into my breaker it's a bit tight in this box there's not a lot of room so you probably will be better off going for a fuse which I probably should have done rather than the breaker it'd be much easier to bung a fuse over here and just connect the positive straight into there it shortens the run which is better to shorten the run as much as you possible can um, and it's easier to fit but in the end it's gone in it sits there it's bolted to the side um, cable coming out of there protection again and onto the positive terminal and I've left it switched off at the moment because I've still got the other side to connect up properly fully right so that's the controller installed this is just behind the passenger seat area um, and the cover goes over this um, which you'll see later on it just about fits in here I was hoping to get it sideways and have the solar panel next to it but uh, controller because I've got a solar controller but there's no way for the space we've got and then the um, protection side of it because this is the output so the batteries are coming in from the vehicle it's the output to the leisure battery goes into protection and then up to the leisure battery now you might notice that on the leisure battery one I've used a, a black cable for now it's a temporary because I've run out I was about six inches short of being able to complete the job so I'm going to use that for now but I'll get some more on order but then um, when this battery comes out and a new battery goes in which will be stored in here um, all this this side of it will be changed probably anyway in here um, I've had to make up a negative bar which is just a piece of copper plate bar that I've got um, bolted together to, um, because there's too many terminals on the shunt and there's no way I'm going to get it all on so the negative from the Victron controller comes down onto here and then goes into the shunt and there's the negatives for all the van so they're all connected into the shunt everything has to be before my shunt to be able for the shunt to be able to read the voltage and then that goes up to the battery so that's everything connected up really now for the vehicle side of things um, you need to stop the charge going into these EBLs which for us is under the driver's seat and you need to stop that because otherwise it's just going to be charging um, from the vehicle battery straight through the EBL because there's a relay inside there that connects it all up as soon as you start the engine up it just connects the um, engine and the ledger batteries together so pins three and four over here right over this side where i'm pointing which are these two cables here are the supply from the engine battery into the ebl which then comes out on pins one and two to your leisure battery so pins one and two are still connected obviously because that's the going to be supplying the rest of the van so i've pulled these out and taped them up but i have taken the fuse out so i'll show you where that fuse is as well all right so down this foot weld which is just behind the driver's seat this is the driver's seat area um to the side you have a piece of plastic cover which has got the step light on and it says up there that it's 12 volt fuses in here some people said there isn't no fuses in it but I'll show you there is so apart from the relay banks and that up here down in the corner you've got two fuse holders one of them 15 amp um, I haven't found out what that is yet it might be the, um, the fridge think about it white cables in it might chase that one day but next to it is a 30 amp fuse that was in there just this one here green 30 amp fuse um, that fuse that holder there is the supply from the starter battery or your engine battery yeah going up into your EBL so if you pull that fuse out it takes away the supplies the pins three and four to the EBL 
so that makes it safe then i've just taped up the ends that you saw just because it looks better but it's, and it doesn't touch anything because it's still metal conductors um but it's still safe it's not actually going to be live all right so that's the chair back in place um it fits quite nicely the cables are not catching at all underneath you probably can't see with this video um but they don't catch there's quite a bit of room there um i could have gone a little bit lower on the b2b but then you, if you, the lower you go to be the, this the more it's going to catch the plastic cover that goes over front of this so that makes that's a bit of a problem and over that side now i fitted the victron mppt controller and this is a 30 amp uh, solar controller so the cables here are the original cables from the manufacturer um six mil solar coming in which went in the front i've just pulled them around to the back that's just a um, piece of wood cable tied on and it's still powering into the uh, EBL because there's no so that's pretty much it I'll go over the cable sizing information I said about so you can skip that if you want um, I'll put the covers on these to show you it fitted with the covers so um, you can see it all set up as it would be if you bought it and so finally the covers on the backs of the seats so you wouldn't even notice that the electronics units were in there and installed so right, so I'll just show you the app now, if you can see it. Um, so I've turned the app on, it's the Victron app. And you can see I've got the Orion Smart already being detected there. When you first click on this to set this up, it'll ask you to do an update, so you can do an, better off doing the update. If I click on it now, it'll start to connect by Bluetooth. And so I'm now connected. And down here it says I've got 12.6 volts going in. Oh, it's asking me to change the pin because I haven't changed it. Um, so it's got 12.6 volts going in, and that's from the start battery. Um, because the start battery is on a low voltage, it's saying here that the charge is disabled due to the engine shutdown detection. Um, and it hasn't detected an output voltage. Right, so I'll just start my engine up. I'll have to turn it. And you'll see it start up then. Right, you can see the voltage here is going up 14 volts. It's detected that the voltage has gone up to the right level for charging. It's now saying the battery is charged. It's got well, it's got an output voltage now 13.4 volts, and the battery is charging at maximum current until the absorption voltage is reached. At the end of the bulk charge, battery is 80% charged and ready for use. So I need to look up that whether it goes to 100% charge. Don't understand that really. You also get a graph. Which I'm assuming is showing the graph of the charge that's going on at the moment. On the settings on this, I've got it at absorption 14.9, floats 13.8, bulk time limit 10 hours. Um, not really looks into this as saying I need to le learn more about. Um, so if anyone knows, they can please comment below. I think that's the amount of time that I can bulk charge before it shuts down. Um, the re bulk voltage offset um, at one volt because I was trying to kick this in more into bulk but I couldn't get it to do it that's the voltage I believe it drops down to on float it go back into bulk um, absorption uh, adaptive absorption time I got switched off again something I'm not really got into um, and a fixed absorption time is six hours I mean I'm setting this up because to let you know I had this at preset settings on so if I go to select presets AGM spiral cell I had it set on that and we was driving along the battery got up to 90% on my meter um, and then the whole thing shut down for some reason because I think this is detecting voltage rather than current input and output it thought that the batteries are fully charged um, although this shut down if I put it into lithium mode it started charging again so it's something to need be aware of and keep an eye on something I'm going to have to keep an eye on because I've, um, this is new to me not great really I didn't think that was good but um, I then set up my own settings and I haven't had a problem yet so that's something to be aware of keep an eye on this keep an eye on this when you're driving if you're passionate you can because this will go into this off mode um, when you're driving along so you're not charging your batteries bit disappointed with that really so when I get the lithiums if it still is doing it that's something that's going to cause a problem I'll be sending it back anyway that's the end of this vlog for now this is just for the B2B and a bit on the solar Still got a bit of work to do on the solar. I haven't got a, um, an isolation switch in there, if you, anyone noticed, and I haven't got the, it's still running for the EBL. I'm, a shoot, I'm thinking of running that for its own circuit, but direct to the battery, bypassing the EBL, because the EBL's got um, 
lots of electronics inside. Not too much, it should go straight through and out. But it's a longer run for no reason at all. It doesn't do nothing else apart from go into the EBL, run through all the circuitry in the EBL, and then come back out to the battery. So I might as well run it direct to six mil cable straight to the battery um, to reduce the voltage drop. I'm building the, um, the on the roof, I'm still building the metal bars at the moment, and I'm still waiting for my solar to turn up. I've got two um, Renergy 100 watt solar panels coming, and 120 watt on the roof already, so that will bring me up to 320 watt. So I'll get that all installed, I'll do a video on all that lot. Um, and then we'll see how well this solar gives out power wise. Um, be interesting to see if I can get it up to 30 amps when I've got lithium um, and see if it can take it. Anyway, so I hope you enjoyed it. Please give us a thumbs up and subscribe, and I'll get new videos up and running as soon as I get a bit of time. Right, hey guys, I said I'll explain why I picked out 16mm cable for my installation. So I'll go over the um, decision making I made and calculations and see what you think. So this is the IE regulations, um, table 4D1A. Um, and we're using a single co um, cable and the manufacturers have rated it at 70 degrees for the conductor operating temperature. We're also working at a roughly a 30 degrees ambient temperature. We have a non-armoured uh, and sheaf cable, so we don't have to, we are we don't have to worry about that. So this is the chart that I'm going to be using for my calcul um, current capacity of the cable. And this is the working at the maximum the the cable can take, which we need to work at for fault conditions really. So we, I'm looking at really method C on this for the chart and a little bit of method B I'll probably go more towards method B because although most of mine is in the air clip direct sort of thing um, I've got some going through K conduit just for protection so you could come to method B really um, we've got a two core or single core cable and we're running on um, DC so we look at this chart here so coming down to 16 millimeters and going down this chart here, we've got a rating of 76 amps. If it was a method C, we've got a rating of 87 amps. So we were between them two, really, for my installation. So, so I picked 80 amps, yeah, and us because that seems to be a fair enough safe margin. And that's the current rating that the cable can take at maximum, really, before we start getting any problems. Now, this is controversial because manufacturers are rating these battery cables, what they say, for a lot higher. I've seen 110, 150 amp rating on these cables. And, the, and I've, on a forum, I was talking to someone who rated it at 250 amps. Now, if you're going by manufacturers' specifications for the cables, and if you read into their manuals and they look at the time that the current's going to be running through the, the cable, so if you're running a starter motor for a short period of time, a couple of, on and off a couple of times, and they take them calculations because it's not a constant current it can take up to the higher current rating that they're specifying but that we're, we're installing a charging circuit which is going to have a constant charge voltage and in fault conditions this could go up quite high so we're looking at this table because this is looking at constant rating so 80 amps is the maximum the cable can take continuously that that's the way i read it so that's the reason why we're taking 80 amps and this is the maximum this is not what I've designed mine for because as you know I've got 40 amp circuit breakers in my setup so it should be quite safe for this rating like I said earlier you could actually lower this down this rating because 10 millimeters could easily take 57 um, to, to 65 so we're still about within the region of 40 amps but we are pushing the boundary lines and some people said you can use six but you really are um, well, you, your circuit breaker should go at that rate, um, and the DC DC is running at 30 um, amps. So, but cable co cables don't cost a lot of money really. So you you've got to think about the safety of the band, and then we've got to take into some other things into consideration as well, which I'll go over. So one of the other charts I use is this one, um, which is for um, aircraft wiring, um, which is the same as for vehicle wiring. And this is the, and you can probably use this for any wine really. Um, and this is the temperature rating that the cable will run at at certain ampage. And this is the top. Um, this I can't highlight this, but the top lines up here is AWG cable rating. So we're looking at six for the 16 millimeters roughly. 
um, as we're looking at this line that goes down here. And if we run at a fault conditions of 80 amps, because say that my circuit break, say I had an 80 amp circuit break on there and it hasn't tripped out and we've got an overload of 80 amps running through the cable, then we go up here to the line, go along horizontally and we come out about 32, 30, uh, 32 34 um, degrees Celsius. And using the formula on the side, we add that figure here that we get to our ambient, ambient temperature, which is 30 degrees, and we end up with a figure of 62 degrees. And that's the temperature that the cable core will be running at. Um, so at fault conditions at 62 degrees, we're running at quite a hot cable, right next to your lithium battery and your lead-acid lead batteries and all your other installations within the van. Now obviously, mine has got a 40 amp fuse, so this line comes right down here off the screen, so the temperature will never get that high and it should run quite cold, even in fault conditions. But you can see how putting a too big a fuse on a 16mm cable, just because the cable can take it, how hot this cable will get. And that heat is, like I say, within your van, so it's quite, um, I would say that's quite bad, really. And then the last thing we need to take into account is your voltage drop. Now, we don't want to go anything above 3% voltage drop, which is what the regulations specify. Um, and you want to keep the voltage drop as low as possible, because it's the charging circuit we're looking at. So this is the formula for voltage drop. The first thing we need to get is the millivolts per amp per meter, which we get from the IE regs again. In it's chart over here, 4D, 2B chart. For 16 millimeter, with two core DC circuit, we're looking at 2.8, although it's 2.8 for the AC anyway. Um, so we get that figure, and we put that 2.8 in there I've highlighted. You then times it by IB, which is the current design Cap, uh, the current design cap, I'll get it right. The, the amount of current that the circuit's going to take, but we designed it for, um, which is 30 amps because we've got a DC to DC converter which is rated at 30 amps, so it could run at 30 amps continuously, really. And then we need the length, and I bought two meters of the cable and I used it all, so I'm going to go for two meters for the length of that circuit. So we times all that together. And then we divide that figure by a thousand to convert it from millivolts to volts, and that'll give us our figure of a voltage drop within volts. And I've done my calculations to work it out as 0.168 volts, which is the voltage drop. And if we convert that to percentage, that actually works out at 1.4%. So we're half um, the way down compared to the rated 3%, which is, um, which is specified. And obviously you could increase your cable and reduce that voltage drop even further and that's one of the things that people will consider. I have seen people use 35mm cable to, for that reason but then you've got to take into account you've got to get these cables terminated um, and they're not going to get into the Victron controller at 35mm but it will drop your voltage drop and you'll be well alright for the current ratings and temperature ratings of the cable. So anyway that's my um, reasons for picking the 16 millimeter cable so i hope that's helpful to some people please comment below it, um, if you disagree with me that's fine it, i've been on quite a few forums and i'm on the ie regs forums as well and um, some of the stuff i've got here has come from there especially the um temperature one which came from a guy in the ie regs um so it is controversial because um ie regs just specify stuff for household electrics and everyone sticks to it but when it comes to vehicles, people sort of stray away from it a lot because you're not always carrying the current continuously and you have different temperature ratings and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, please comment below. I'm quite happy to have a discussion on it. I um, hope you enjoyed the video for this one. Um, give us a thumbs up and subscribe.